Conversations. That's where it all begins. Conversations. Just a little talk here and there. Arrow.net. A-R-R-O-E dot net. We are unplugged and totally uncut with Gary Lennon. Gary, this is a documentary that has captivated my attention in the way of going, wow, is this still going on? And if not, why not? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, you, you would think that um, there'd be some c- closer resolution to this, but but no, it's it's still very much in play. And, and you know, and it's not even on the front page of the newspapers. It's almost like you know. First of all, the I have so many Cuban connections, but the, but you, you sit there and you go, all of these things that we read in the 1960s about Cuba and stuff like that, and 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 it's like, why? Why would they want to spy on us? Was it was it connected to this this Cold War? Yeah, I think um, what what we've seen is is that after the Cuban Revolution, um, essentially the people that left Cuba were were the wealthier people. They were right. kind of the middle and the upper class people, and they are looking to topple the the current regime. So the reason the the spies' perspective is that they were there protecting Cuban interests, whereas in the the government, the official government of Cuba, whereas in the people in Florida, of which there are many different organizations. Are their sole focus focus is to bring about the end, you know, bring about regime change. Mm. So it, it wasn't necessarily the Cubans' position is that they were actually spying on Cubans that were based in Florida rather than spying on America. Now, over the course of the film, we see that doesn't quite pan out the way that they said it, but but that's their starting point. It's interesting you say that in, in, in those words, because there were many times throughout the book I'm going, was was America a, a safe zone? Did they come here to kind of just watch what's going on and then rep- report back? And that's exactly what you just said. Yeah, very much. So, so you had these organizations that were using Florida as their base. They were, you know, and, and this isn't me saying this. They've, they're all very open about this. Yeah. Uh, they actually launched attacks on Cuba from Florida. Uh, some of these attacks were from, you know, small speedboats. Other attacks were um, more substantial. You know, there was a big terror campaign in, in the 90s uh, where they were bombed the hotels of downtown Havana. Um, and the reason, obviously, that's a terrible thing to happen in a general sense, but it was particularly important to Cuba because their sole industry really, their, the overwhelming majority of their economy was coming from tourism. Yep. So when that, if that was to be taken away from them, it actually went from being an incident of crime or a small scale terrorist attack to something that just completely affected their economy, you know, 80, 90%. Mm. So they, from their perspective, they had to stop it. Hence this big Cuban uh, spy ring, which was, was known as the WASP network. I mean, it sounds so Hollywood, Gary. I mean, it really does. And that, I think that's my attraction to it. It's like, oh, my God. I know Johnny Depp is in court right now, but I want Johnny Depp to be in this dang movie. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 very much. You know, it's, it is. Um, we, we live such quiet lives. You know, most of the time we, we have very little going on beyond the mundane, you know, bad Wi-Fi, you know, not, not you know, bad parking. This is the extent of our challenges. <laughs> Whereas in for the, the life of a spy is, is just incredible jeopardy all the time. One full move they could be in jail one false move they could be dead so inherently the de- life of a spy is interesting mm. and you know i grew up and grew up loving spy films in the 1980s my dad used to always read spy books you know things like john le carre you know the, all, all that stuff so i grew up loving this type of world and, and that was our real ambition for this it was to make the book a really t- good spy film the book we're talking about is Castro's Spies, which is now available everywhere. The thing is, is that I love the way that you go inside history. It doesn't look like you faced any walls, but I'm sure you did. Yeah, one of the things we learned was that uh, Cuba gets approached by a lot of um, left-leaning, fil- well-intentioned filmmakers. Uh, a lot of them are kind of amateurs, let's, let's be <laughs> honest. And as a result, you know, it's difficult to to get things moving because they get quite a lot of these approaches. And then also, you know, you do have a substantial distance between Ireland and, and Cuba, and it doesn't have the tech, you know, it doesn't have the internet speed, it doesn't have the communication network that you and I take for, for granted. So, th- so just the simple practical stuff takes a little bit longer. And um, so it took us, you know, I had to go, we were there five or six times over the course of production, and th- that, that was over kind of a period of a number of years. So, so it does take a lot of work. But once we got in, we actually were, we were surprised at how welcoming the, the Cuban people were. 
to our approaches. Speaking of getting in, that also included the FBI surveillance footage. I mean, I mean that you don't just knock on their <laughs> door and say, "Hey, look, uh, can we can we look at some things here? We're we're Americans, we can do this." <laughs> yeah, this was fantastic. You know, like the FBI was so helpful towards us. Um, and as part of our production, you know, they really, they, their records are, are freely available. So, so we were able to use them and all the court transcripts for kind of fact checking and cross checking. And then also we got to talk to some of the people that actually were involved in, in the kind of takedown of them. And then also how they kind of they practically did it, you know, how they cracked the codes. And, and this was what we fed into the, there are reconstruction scenes and, and through our interviews. So, so that was fantastic. But I think it's also, it's just, it's one thing to hear about what a spy looks like, but it's, <laughs> it's another thing to actually see them, you know, swapping something in the, in the toilet of a Wendy's, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's this, this, this is kind of, this is what, it, this is what a spy is like, you know, it's not. And also this was the last era before things went digital. You know, this was before everyone had mobile phones and cameras everywhere. So it was kind of, you know, this analog world of tape recorders, dictaphones, you know, the uh, the Cubans didn't have any money, so they were going into Radio Shack to, to buy their gear. Oh you know, this is, it was quite a, it's, it's quite a world away from, you know, M and James Bond. So, um, you know, this is, this is what they brought to it. You know, they, they didn't have money, but they had like really strong training and, and a lot of tenacity and commitment. You know, these are Un, you know, unwavering in their support of, of what they believe in. You talk about that commitment right away. I think of Geraldo Hernandez because he said he would do it again. Yeah. You know, I think we all have to take a step back and like imagine going to jail for 15 years and saying mm-hmm. you'd, you'd hop on a plane and just go back and do it again if called. You know, it's, it's irrespective of your politics. I think you can't but admire their, their commitment. So, why was it illegal? If they were spying on their own country from this country, why is that illegal? Well, I think th- there's a couple of things. You know, if for Cuba, for Cuban agents to legally operate in America, and I know this sounds counterintuitive, they actually have to register oh, with <laughs> their embassy. Um, so, so, so that was that. But they, they ended up actually being arrested for other crimes rather than spying. It, you know, it's a bit of a technical thing, but it's it's the they weren't really arrested for that. They were arrested for being foreign agents, unregistered foreign agents. And then the other big thing that they were arrested for was an accusation of murder, which, oh, which happened. Um, there was an, a member of um, it's called Brothers to the Rescue, and the Brothers to the Rescue are an organization set up by. Cuban emigres to rescue, initially to rescue Cuban, the, if you can recall all the Cubans that used to try and make it by raft to America. So they used to rescue them in the sea and that, and that was their and that was their job. But over the course of their existence, the legislation changed. So they couldn't just simply rescue people and bring them to Florida. They would be returned to Cuba. So as a result, they changed their, their approach and they actually started flying over Cuba mm. and they started dro- dropping leaflets, trying to get people to overturn the government uh, and, and in, in this, and, you know, and other similar things to that. So as that happened a number of times, um, eventually the Cubans decided they didn't want to, they weren't prepared to accept it any longer. And they, um, the Cuban Air Force shot down oh, God. Um, one of these planes. Um, so the... The, the crux of it is, and again, this is your politics as to which side you believe. The Cubans say it was shot in their airspace, whereas in the members of Brothers to the Rescue said it was over international airspace. So um, it was the, the the latter position was upheld by the court in Miami, and that's why they were sent to jail for so long. Wow! Getting the opportunity to talk with those that are involved. Do you, are you the student? Are you the journalist? Are you the author? Because I mean, I mean, I mean, to get people. I mean, I, I would sit there and just take it all in. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a number of things going on. You know, the each side is a hundred percent assured of their correctness. You know, they all believe they're right. So each each of the you know, the, the kind of three parties involved, you know, the Cuban spies, the, the, the Cubans that were based in Florida, that they were, you know, infiltrating their organizations. And then the American political and uh, sorry, legal and, uh, and policing organizations, you know, each one of them were very open with us. You know, they, they very much said, this is what we did. Everything they did is on public record as a result of the trial. So the so the issue isn't at play as to who did what. Everyone everyone admits to what they did. I think what the interesting thing is 
is is deciding who is ultimately right and and that's what and the way we presented it is with without bias and we and we hope the audience then finds it interesting as to what position they come down on. I, I, I have to chuckle in a way that, you know, the Cuba that's inside this book in Castro Spies versus the Ron DeSantis uh, Florida today. And, and it's like, wow, what would Ron <laughs> do in a moment like this? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's safe to say they're, they're two very different worlds. Um, <laughs> and, in, and, and in the documentary, that's what we try and show. You know, we, we try and show that how things have changed. I, I, I think you know, Miami is a very interesting place. You know, I think it's arguably the capital of Latin America. It's not just kind of the, you know, the, the main city of Florida. Um, all things Latin America go through Miami. And that's why you have such a, you know, it's such a cocktail of interest and in, in espionage. Interesting that, that you say that that's, you know, one, one of the areas of Latin America, because Antonio was living the American dream and somehow he found it in his heart that I need to invest in, in, in this thing and, and try to get information back home. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he, well, he was the, the role of a spy. In many ways, is similar to an actor. You know, they're oh. acting out. They're, you know, they're pretending. You know, they're pretending what they're doing is 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 something so that they can get information from some somewhere else. So th- this is one of the challenges you face as as a filmmaker when you're talking to spies. You know, it's it's uh, what actually happened. Who who has done it? Uh, I think what gave us a little bit of confidence. Um, it was just you have to do the research, and I think you have to do an awful lot. And then the position that the Cubans took when they were in trial was that they would admit to what they did. So we have this <laughs> massive court document um, where they explain what they did, how they did it, and then you also had the FBI explaining how they cracked their codes, how they infiltrated their uh, spy layers. So we had it coming from a mu- multiple sources, and then it, the way it panned out is that what people told us on camera matched with what our, what our research had showed us. It, it's it's so fascinating that you're sharing this story in a time where we need stories like this because we all have these images of what a spy is. I love the fact that you know that you, the, the thing you talked about about meeting in bathrooms and stuff like that. I always picture park <laughs> park benches is where I always see spies. I mean, I mean, I mean, how are you able to speak to a spy and not have to look over your shoulder wondering if you're being followed? <laughs> well, the, the spies have left. America now, and it's safe to say that they will never go back. So in Cuba now, these spies are are national heroes. You yeah. know, they're they're absolutely you know they're 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 as famous as Michael Jordan or Muhammad Ali is in America. You know, their pictures adorn walls. You know, apart from Fidel Castro, they'd be the most famous people in their country. So they have very they've got very senior positions of of uh, authority and um, in in various different institutions in Cuba. So, you know, I think their, their spying days are behind them, you know. So when I was meeting with them, they, they're certainly, I didn't really have to look over my shoulder. And to be honest, I had, no, <laughs> I had nothing of value that they could take. So um, it, was, it was more just, it was just kind of, as I said, to get back to something I kind of touched on earlier, it's just really fascinating to meet a spy. You know, like the, we come across other films and TV series of things like, you know, Edward Snowden, and Edward Snowden changed sides, whereas in these spies absolutely did not change sides. They are very much believe in what they did, and they would do it all again. So it's just kind of fascinating to see someone, to hear how they did their training, to hear about how their characters were formed, and re- really just interesting lives. And again, irrespective of your politics, these people have led extraordinary lives, and it makes great Great film. You you speak of that loyalty. That's Cuban culture right there. Because my son in law is Cuban and he speaks of family and country. Yeah, yeah, it it, it is. You know, I think there's um, there's certain parts of the world that you can say things like you just said there. You know, and I think you can really see it in Cuba. They have this very strong sense of, of family and community. And then because they've been in isolation for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this real inner strength that they have, you know, and to, to, st- to, to, for their country to continue, they've, you know, they're very resourceful, they're very tenacious, and that's transferred into their, you know, their espionage activities, you know, for very little money. I think they, ra- you know, their entire budget was something like, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, it's like 30 or $32,000 wow. for the entire spy network of, of many dozen of people in Florida. So, you know, that's small. That's very much small change. Wow. So Rene Gonzalez, he lives in Chicago. He's a spy. And but but does he live a normal life in Chicago while doing all of this? 
well, he was born in Chicago, but he actually lived in Miami oh. the, the whole time that he was doing doing his uh, kind of his spy work. So yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, he had um, he was working as a pilot with this organization I mentioned earlier, Brothers to the Rescue. So he was spying. He was actually flying the planes of this organization that was trying to rescue people that were in the sea. And at the same time, he was feeding information back to the Cuban government as to their other activities. So, th- so that's what he was doing. But it very much, you know, he lived in a very modest apartment. Eventually, his wife came out to join him from Cuba. So um, it was, you know, if you saw him on the street, you would just think, oh, this is an average guy. <laughs> but he was far from average. You know, I'm going to be looking at people differently now because of this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you see anyone, you know, with, with, with dark glasses and hats and talking behind newspapers, you know, they're almost certainly a <laughs> Now, we all know that what we do in the everyday world is a continuation of something that, that, you know, everything leads to one thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. So when you release a book like this, Castro Spies, what's the next one? What, because you, you can't stop. You love doing what you do. Yeah, so, so just to just to say, Castro Spies is a documentary mm-hmm. rather not, rather than a book. But the in terms of a the next one is I'm working on I've just finished a, a documentary on Chinese piano players. What? Which is called Piano Dreams. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, it's a group of Chinese children, uh, pr- Chinese piano prodigies, and the kind of the incredible sacrifices that they and their families make to try and become the next star. So now when, when you that to me, that's investigating creativity. That's because, I mean, when, when, when families are involved like that, that's that's putting the, the mind in a different place. What what did you physically learn from that? And is there something that, that, that you've activated in your own chapters when you get that close to creativity? Yeah, I think like one of the things that China has that's so different to where I'm from is it's just so intense. Yep. You know, it's so intense. The competition is so intense. Every single position is so intense. You know, every family has got one child, two parents four grandparents there's just this insane intense pressure on everyone there and as a result the, the work ethic that they have to to actually try and re- rise above that is truly remarkable it's not like anything i've seen in, in ireland or this part of the world so you know it's it's 95 percent perspiration and then kind of five percent inspiration one, once again, that's two back-to-back documentaries that are about country and family. I mean, I mean, th- th- I mean, and, and what you're doing with us is sharing with us the the you know what 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 it's like behind the scenes where most of us we can't get past Google. Yeah, I suppose we we all do a job that kind of treats you know that hones into our personality. And one of the things that I used to get in an awful lot of trouble with as a boy, especially in school, was my just constant talking. I, I find people interesting. So it, it's, it's kind of, it's good when you're a filmmaker, it's bad when you're a student in, in a very strict Catholic school in, in, in Dublin. But um, it's, I, I find people inherently interesting and, and I enjoy spending time. I, I enjoy seeing people from different cultures. And every so often, I'm fortunate enough to pull all those things together to make a film. Oh, my God. I love that about you, because the, during the lockdown, when everything there were there were no jobs anywhere. Here's this guy, me. I needed to be with people. The only thing that was open was a grocery store. So I went to a grocery store and said, please hire me. I need to be with people. <laughs> my God, people are funny. They've got stories. Yeah, no, they, they really are. I think you just have to open your ears a little bit. I think we're also <laughs> I, I think we're also busy and there's so much distractions on things, you know, be it different forms of technology that we don't take the same amount of time that we used to do to, to, to listen to people, but it's, it's fun. Wow. We should talk to strangers more. I, I, I'm so with you on that. Gary, where can people go to get more love and, and share love with you and find out more about what you're doing and how you're growing forward? Thank you very much. Yeah. Our company is called Gambit Pictures. Castro Spies is available on, on, a, on a large number of um, platforms in America, iTunes, Amazon Prime, a lot of the other TVODs. So it would be great if you could support us and uh, we'd like to show you the next films. Excellent. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Well, you be brilliant today. Okay, Gary. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye, guy. Cheers.